Good afternoon. So I think it's time and let's get started. Let's see how the after lunch coma will affect the audience, but let's hope I can wake you away, away, away from that. So, hi everyone, I'm Olli Pietikainen, flying in here from Finland, and I'm working with this company called Nitor. Uh, we are a software consulting company, surprise, surprise, with around 10 agile coaches, and basically we do a lot of safe, kind of using the safe as a framework for the um, helping organization to become more agile. And uh, for a couple of years that I've been working with Nitor, I have had the privilege to work with for example, the two biggest banks in Finland, and telecom operator, and then this kind of telecom product organization, a product business, well, with kind of first-hand, oh yeah, and one IT service provider as well. All of them were choosing safe, and they were coming to us for Nitor to help for that. We looked around on different frameworks, and we've seen that the safe is the best fit for us, so could you please come and help us? And from there, I was starting to see that perhaps there's something like on here. So then the wording of Troy and horse came from that. So there's the pull for it from the marketplace. And I've been first time working uh, on these clients and then seeing from different kind of colleagues, sharing all the war stories from the different uh, clients that we worked with, they kind of started to see different patterns that what people were really trying to get so trying to get that kind of business agility, actually it's more better term than the enterprise agility, it's the business agility to be able to respond to changes of the changing marketplace and seeing that their current ways of working. Basically, huge project organizations work is scattered to the million different projects and kind of nothing seems to go forward. So in that kind of situations, we were usually brought in as, as consultants to help. And so actually this talk shouldn't be called this Trojan horse for enterprise agility. It should have the question mark in the end and it should have the business agility as a term. And the next 45 minutes or 40 minutes, let's explore that topic where, where it leads. So a couple of definitions first. So let me read out here. So Trojan horse, Greek mythology, a hollow wooden statue of horse which the Greeks uh, are said to have concealed themselves in order to enter Troy. So they were sieging this town of Troy uh, for 10 years, says the legends, and then they come up with this scheme of let's put our special forces inside a wooden horse and give that as a gift for the Trojan folks and then leave, but seem like we leave. And then in the silence of the night, the uh, Greek soldiers sneak out of the wooden horse and open the city gates and then let the uh, Greeks to march in and, well, destroy the town of Troy. So I'm not sure if that's a good metaphor for this agility. Uh, but what it is uh, meaning for the agility is that it kind of destroys the ways of working that they were in place. So the project organization, very fragmented work, and, and with the kind of driver of trying to achieve this business agility without the full understanding of what that actually means, organizations are ready to kind of buy, buy into safe and say that, Ooh, let's take one safe, please, and let's implement that. Okay. And the business agility. So business agility as a term, this is coined by or defined by um, Ivan Liebern. Uh, so business agility, is the organization's ability um, to rapidly respond to change by adapting its initial stable configuration. Business uh, agility can be maintained by maintaining and adopting goods and services to meet customer demands, adjusting the changes in business environment, and taking advantage of human resources. So it's the holistic view of the whole organization, the whole enterprise, trying to match the needs of the market. So it's kind of constant flux Things are changing, demand, demands from the clients and the customer base are changing. So how the organization can actually adapt to that pace of change. And the, well, they see very clearly that the old ways, kind of, the, well, waterfall is a bit of a kind of, um, uh, it's, it's something that you uh, put up and you beat it and it's kind of easy to beat the wa waterfall method. But no one's really doing waterfall methods. It's more like they're doing 
project, and that's what we should be actually be, be the one kind mm, attacking against. No, not really right message, but be against projects and this kind of fragmented work instead of looking more on lean and agile ways of working so that we could adapt to the changing marketplace and therefore serve the customers better and therefore get more revenue. So after all, it's a business. Why SAFE could be the Trojan horse? So, as I said earlier, there's the pull for it. So, these are kind of uh, translated quotes from clients or someone's need, uh, asking for kind of our help. So, that we want to be more agile. We looked into different frameworks and decided that SAFE is the best. Or, if you just come in and design a blueprint for our organization and then give it to us, we'll implement it. We are great at change management. We're just going to implement SAFE and be done with it. So there's the kind of misunderstanding what really agility means and what they're really getting themselves into when they're getting consultants or whoever the kind of internal folks to buy into SAFE and start doing the whole organization-wide transformation with that framework. And that applies to all the frameworks, especially the scaling frameworks, but SAFE is kind of the, the best and the worst in it because it has been packaged so kind of in sellable form. So you can sell it and you can buy it and easy to buy as a package solution for it. So there's the good side of that and there's the bad side of that. Um, then why it could be a Trojan horse is also that it goes to the methods. So the quote about Deming, the goal without methods is nonsense. So just happy hippie thoughts that we all should work together doesn't really solve anything. We really need to get going on how do we work together. And those frameworks give us the starting point of actually start to collaborate, start to communicate together because we have the way of working. And from that new way of working forms new habits and forms a new culture. So the doing comes first and then comes the culture shift. But there has to be those tools and tools and methods, and unfortunately those need to be there to make the actual change on humans' uh, behavior possible. And then it could be a Trojan horse because people are very kind of easily fooled into buying ready-made, out-of-the-box solutions. I don't want to think. Just give it to me. Something easy, give it to me. That's easy. I can box here. Good agility. One agility, please. So these are the things that people who don't want to think, and that's like all of us, are easily fooled by that. And if they don't know what it actually entails to be agile, to get there, to move towards constantly evolving as an organization, then they think that they can buy that in a box. And SAFE is perceived as the method. So I don't know how it's here in Ukraine. Uh, I was here a couple of weeks ago, um, a training, so I'm one of those pyramid scheme uh, trainers who sells safe certifications, not going to sell them today to you, no, don't buy it. Uh, but I was here uh, for a uh, Ukrainian company who's doing, well, offshoring uh, for a US company. And they got to be trained because their client was mandating that X amount of uh, the vendor's personnel has to be certified in SAFE. So there's that kind of demand for it and that kind of um, people have bought into it. Probably because it's an easy, nice box to have and it's easy to buy and then require that people certify, certify themselves on it. Um, so, a bit before about the safe before we go into the different aspects. So, how many of you have seen or know what safe is on scale Dutch framework? Okay, so roughly a half. Of, a half. So, I have a couple of uh, terms to go there before I, I go into. I'm not going to go to mechanics in the detail. That's boring, and that's not why you're here. So, it begins, uh, begins with this. Safe is for large enterprises. So already this picture tries to depict uh, how an organization with hundreds of developers could work. So it's not a small thing. If you have only a team or two working on the same product, 
stay away from safe. There's no point of going into the scale that chart framework. You're not scaling. There's no economies of scale in software development. There are only these economies of scale. So we saw that the more we have members on the teams, the more we have the communication lines, the more hectic it becomes. So there are only these economies of scale in software development. Start, uh, try to stay small as long as possible, but when you can't, then it's time to look for scaling approaches. One is less, one is safe. Uh, those are the two that I've been reading and studying with and seeing in practice, and then Nexus and that and da-da-da-da-da. There's kind of a million of them. But this is the kind of safe essentials, what they came up, uh, because they were saying this kind of safe big picture was too complicated for the majority, so they dumb it down a bit and came up with this essential, which is, well, not that... Lots of icons and concepts on that picture as well. But what it uh, conveys is that in the foundation there's the teams, so scrum team, scrum team, third scrum team, fourth, so on and so forth. And those teams are coordinated by the so-called program layer. So there's team layer, and then Safe talks about the program layer. So it's just abstraction levels of those. Teams work on sprints by default, by any rule of thumb. And then the sprints are like two weeks length by rule of thumb, and Teams can continue to work just like a Scrum team does. But now that we, when we need multiple Scrum teams to work together to achieve some kind of common goal, we are building a big product that requires multiple teams to deliver on time, then there needs to be some kind of structure to align those teams so that we can work kind of on the same direction. So for the alignment, I require, uh, kind of ask you to trust me a bit, so close your eyes and imagine your way to this room today. So how you walked into this room. Yeah? Kind of waking up in the morning from that point and then coming to this room and being lunch and all that. And now point to me where is west. Hand up and point to west. Yeah, eyes open, keep your hands pointing. So we have a up there, 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 multiple different directions going on on the same specific room. And with the, that easy defined, easily defined objective of pointing to certain direction. Now imagine how much harder is it when you have 100 people developing a one product and we're trying to develop a one product, that one true north or east or west or whatever the direction is that we want to be going and we have people pulling to different directions. Now, <laughs> uh, pulling the different directions, we need to have some level of, of kind of coordination on that. How do we uh, pull the same direction? And that's the, what the program level is all about. It provides that kind of overall guidance for the whole, whole train. So the team of teams, the collection of teams is called an agile release train. Don't ask me why. I won't tell it now here, ask me later. Um, and that's about it. And then there's the portfolio part, which is there, up there. And it talks only about kind of this budgeting part. So in SAFE, they separate the budget from the scope. So there are no more projects and project budgets available, but the budget is given for the organization that is developing the software. So it's actually the kind of teams that are getting the money and prioritizing their work within that budget and using that the best they can. I will return on that a bit later. Then, that's the essentials. Then they have the so-called three-layer safe, where they have the portfolio. So a bit more about portfolio, and there's a kind of epics and things like that. So uh, adds on top of, so like Scrum teams, they work on user stories, the program level does planning on feature level, and then the portfolio level does planning on epic level. So you have this kind of three-level hierarchy of epic splitting to feature, splitting to stories. Well, if you think about three-level hierarchies in Agile requirements, well, I could remind you of Mike Cohn, and he talks about themes, epics, and stories. Huge things, split into smaller things, split into workable chunks. Precisely the same idea. Nothing new under the sun here. Different terms. And then it gets a bit hairy. So, 
we have the four level safe of value stream layer there in the middle. But again, nothing new under the sun, just the uh, same practice or pattern of, um, of uh, aggregating and adding abstraction. So that middle layer there is only for uh, really coordinating the actions of multiple trains. So when you have a product that you're building that is, requires 1,000 developers, you need to have some kind of structures available and split those into meaningful teams. Just like we don't have 100 people teams, we don't have 500 or 1,000 people trains. So it's about splitting and defining those communication and borders so that we minimize, minimize the dependencies between the different units in the organization. But, well, let's move it away from that. That's a nasty picture and it's probably the worst place to start learning about SAFE and what it is. What it is. But from that picture, uh, look into why it could be a join host. So, the thing is, it organizes around the value. It organizes around the value that we're trying to deliver. So, instead of those silos, the functional silos that you might have, kind of, well, the business analysts doing the requirements gathering in their own silo, and then you have the developers or architects in their own silo and testers in their own functional silo, and then for each of the projects that you're trying to do, you pick people from those different silos, those cost centers, put them together in the virtual organization and set them to do this project. And after they've done the project, you return the people back to the silos and pick a different set of people and team to another project. So that's how project organization often work. Now what SAFE takes is, okay, we take all the people that are required to deliver that some kind of valuable end result, put them in together, call that an agile release train, and then just feed a bit more work to them. More work, more work, more work. You finish this one project, no problem, there's another one coming in. All the healthy organizations have more work to do than they have capacity or resources to do. So there won't be a shortage of, of work. But they prioritize that there and, and organize for the product. Mm. Yes, so finding the structure that minimizes the dependencies and their ill effects. So that's also in safe, just like in uh, less in. Roland's uh, presentation was saying about the same thing. And just like the Scrum teams should be uh, cross-functional, also the train should be cross-functional. So when, when the situation is that you cannot really put together all the expertise needed to deliver that product, uh, project or whatever you want to call it, a product, in one single team of uh, seven developers, you need to scale it somehow. And that's the method for scaling is the Agile release train, which is the virtual organization around the value delivery. So at least we can handle the dependencies across different teams within that one. Budgeting. That's one big, big change that people don't realize what comes with SAFE and what it kind of relies on. So it requires that uh, we separate the scope of the things that we're building from the money that we are using to build them with. So in normal project, you have the scope, you have list of requirements need to be happening on kind of this schedule and with this money, and they are tightly knit together. And if you don't get them kind of uh, first, uh, kind of right on the first time, then you have to go there like, okay, how do I move this? I have to change management process and to negotiate the budget or negotiate the scope and, and on and on and on and on these discussions go. And as SAFE does, it remo removes this connection between the scope and the budget. So we have the scope in the backlogs. On all of the different levels, we have different backlogs, and those backlogs are prioritized. And then we have the budget that is given for those trains that have the backlog. An example of that could be that uh, um, the bank I was working with, or it has more like bank and insurance company and almost everything nowadays, they actually started leasing cars now. Uh, they had the portfolio of, uh, of kind of um, insurances. So insurance business was with its own portfolio, and within that they have multiple trains, one's working with the kind of health insurances and all the systems related to that one, and then another train working on uh, this kind of car insurances, non-health insurances. Now they have the both of them have their own backlogs of things that were prioritized, and then the portfolio level when they are giving the budgets, 
instead of giving money for each of those individual initiatives in those backlogs, they were giving it so that we have this X million euros now for development, we're going to give 40% to that for the health insurance side and 60% for the non-health insurance side. And within that, you can do whatever you want with it. So optimize the money, prioritize the work, work on the most important things first and get things done. Remove the discussions about the budget and how much something costs immediately and kind of enable that kind of agility that we, when things change, we can actually change them instead of having that budget discussion again. Portfolio management. So that's something that, well, in my view, uh, portfolio management is something that is needed. So that is something that lacks in many of the other methods. So I don't really see portfolio management in less or others. It's kind of like just we have the product and we are building that one. And now SAFE takes the concept of a portfolio and provides the kind of container for the portfolio. So it's in there in the big picture. We have the certain stakeholders there doing the work there. And it's the place for centralized decision making. And centralized decision making, it's about things that have high impact, long lasting effects, and then also the budget. So where do we actually spend our resources in? But all the others should be decentralized. And decentralization, meaning that we, uh, in SAFE, if you, if you look at SAFE by the book, if you would like to say so, it's about pushing the decision making as low as possible. So often you hear that, well, SAFE is top down and it's driving from the top and all the decisions are done by the portfolio and then it just trickles down there somewhere. Well, no. So it actually emphasizes a lot about that decentralization. And one of the decentralization patterns is the um, kind of troikas. So in Scrum team, you have the Scrum master taking care about the facilitation, how do we work, how way, ways of working, how they work, product owner working on the content on how we work, and the team on how do we actually build that thing. And the same pattern is taken for the program level to work on the release train engineer or chief scrum master, if you want to say, product manager, or you could call it the chief product owner, and then the architect working on more the, the technical level on the higher abstraction. So it's separate the different roles so they form the same healthy balance as they form in the scrum team, also in the team of teams level. And one thing I like is that there are no steering groups in SAFE. So, so no steering groups, no kind of waiting for steering group decisions to whether we move forward on this or have a clearance to run this thing. Do it. Then another thing that could enable it to be something for the business agility actually is the cross domain planning. So uh, teams plan kind of teams plan and uh, sprints, and then the teams get together and plan as a whole program for 10 weeks of time. So every 10 weeks they get together, plan roughly what's coming up next, and then continue to planning in the teams. So getting together all the teams in regular cadence, and then going back to your own teams and continuing the work. So we have a bit of a more understanding about a bit of a further future. And then also the communities of practice worth worth mentioning on this slide because um, easily when we move from functional silos into value-oriented kind of streams, so like that, we have all the people from all the silos working together as a team, then we end up with a situation that this forms a new silo. So we need to break that silo as well. And the community's practice is for cross-pollinating across these different trains. So if you have five trains, 500 people, you have the communities of practice of same roles to so getting together and sharing good ideas. Then uh, built in inspect and adapt. So just like the whole train gets together, the 100 people might get together every 10 weeks for planning for the next increment. They also get together afterwards and have this kind of whole level retro. So things that are out of the sphere's influence of one single team uh, can now get together as team of teams because they have more influence on that and make actual systemic changes so that we can deliver better as a whole. 
Okay. That ends the safe fanboy part of this talk. So, why it might not be the Trojan horse for business agility? First of all, it's seen as an endpoint. It's seen as something that, just like the uh, first quote in the, in the beginning of the presentation, it was that we're going to take this one safe and we're going to implement it, put it into our organization, and flip the switch, and then we're agile. It's really not going to work that way. Uh, or we want to be safe compliant. So I was in one meeting where they were worrying that, can we really change our processes like this? Are we then not safe compliant? And what about if there comes the new safe 5.0 and then we are not compliant with that one? It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. When you start it after that, let go of that and move forward. So in my personal view, I think that uh, SAFE is a good framework to get started with in large organization that is delivering pro, um, products and they're doing it the project-based approach. Lots of projects going on, they might not even know how many projects they have going on, uh, but they're trying to build some kind of product in the end. And then moving away from that project-oriented mindset to an agile mindset, organizing around value and delivering stuff, uh, that's the good longest jump that they could make. But that has to be the first jump, and then comes the next step, and next step, and next step, and next step. Then there's the force fitting it. So using that as kind of a uh, square peg in a round hole. You can slam it in. So there's the one single process to rule them all. Uh, approach that, for example, we have one unit in the organization working really nicely, they got the safe, they're working run, on running the trains and they have the evolved to some level of ways of working that they work on. Then comes some kind of process engineer, decides that this is a good way of working, now I'm going to model this in the process modeling tool and then I could put that on PowerPoint and then require that all the other teams work just like that. Not gonna work, surprise, surprise. But it's really easy to think that precisely because SAFE is so, well, and brilliantly, it's a bit of a too much, but it's neatly packaged and neatly giving one view of it. So it's easy to take that now we're going to take a one view to our whole organization. And if it's a huge organization like a bank and banks IT organizations are, the one view will not fit for all. And that will lead to failing. Um, basic agile stuff, listening to people who are doing the actual work, letting them decide how to work, and then going kind of from this is the last one, so wide and shallow instead of deep and narrow. So trying to get that we have a whole bank IT, like 5,000 developers, and now we're going to start with two agile coaches to implement SAFE. Well, what are the odds of that working out? It's going to be just half-assed work, and it's never going to carry any fruit. It's going to cause more harm than good. And usually what follows from that kind of deep, uh, kind of wide and shallow is the whitewashing of terms. So it's just like Dave was saying in the keynote in the morning, it was, it becomes the new trend from the management that this is how we're going to do it, and then everyone's playing along. Yeah, we're going to do it in those epics. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah right. Yeah, the stories, we were splitting the work into stories and talking about story points and then we converting the story points into man hours and then having individual estimates from individual developers and so forth. So it's only whitewashing that, making it look like it's agile when it's really far from it. Mm. And especially those in the middle one, no whip limits, no smaller batches and no focus on the cost of delay. So easy things to forget when we just rename things and then it's kind of try to work with those, we fo lose the focus of, of what we're truly really trying to achieve. Because it's a lean and focuses on a lot about the lean, uh, reducing the batch sizes, delivering more smaller chunks, focusing on the cost of delay, so how long the cycle time of from idea to from concept to cash is. These are easily, easily forgotten. Then, 
it lacks the true adaptability, in my opinion. So, there is the inspect and adapt. There are the kind of places, the workshops that uh, are there in the place, so that you could kind of say that, yeah, we have the possibility to change. But, well, I just, at one client, they are now ditching the PI plannings. So the program increment plannings, the joint plannings of the whole train together, they are now ditching those and finding another ways to achieve the same result. So I think they are getting the agile stuff. On the other uh, clients, well, I couldn't see that happening on those banks. Not yet, at least. So time will show, but I have my doubts. So in order to actually be agile, it has to have that kind of inbuilt uh, way of changing its own process, its own way of working, and kind of start evolving. And in order it to be a Trojan horse for business agility or agility as a whole, it needs to have this way that it starts the evolutionary process of the organization, not stopping it to some end point. So it has to evolve. Otherwise, we cannot really call it agile. Um, for developing in the design part, SAFE talks about set-based design. So we have multiple different dis uh, kind of options on how we will go on. But when we look at the portfolio level of what kind of ideas we are actually trying to do. So that thing about that Dave had in the keynote that how, how this, this kind of, you might have, try out multiple different approaches, have a pair programming team, for example, doing a proof of concept on those, and then moving forward with the ones that work doesn't exist. Or that we would try out multiple different experiments of how we work and try out different things, how they work, and inspect and adapt from that. It's not non-existent in SAFE. So it's kind of one single blueprint. It's okay as a blueprint, but it's still a one single blueprint, and it's super easy to, to just follow that blueprint, and then you are in trouble. Complex adaptive system? Nope. It's more on the uh, complicated domain. And the kind of neat packaging that the SAFE has. It's a good product to sell and buy. And that's also its pitfall. So because it's the neat pro uh, product, it's a neatly packaged, it's easy to stay within that package. We don't really start to evolve away from that. Stay away, uh, be aware of that. And finally, we come to the focus on the execution, not on the business. So, in my experience, the SAFE has been on focusing on the execution, actually building those things, focusing on delivering stuff instead of talking about it. And that has been on, uh, on the other bank, they, well, at one point when they're starting the journey, they had this one program that my colleague went to be the RTE, aka the program manager, and what the ratio on developers and uh, kind of overhead, so business analysts, managers, what you have, the ratio was one to five. So each of the developers have five some level middle management, someone who's not actually writing code in that program. Now they're moving bit more focusing on the execution and kicking out the overhead, so they're kind of one-to-one -one ratio, but it should be the other way around, so five-to-one or, or whatever fits that. But, so SAFE brings the focus on the execution, and that's a good thing. In many places, that's just what they need. It's the kick to the ass. Now let's actually ship something. Ship, thing, ship it, get it ready, get it out there, get the feedback, closer the circle of the feedback. Faster the feedback, faster do we learn. So in many cases that is what you need, but the moving away, uh, kind of forward from there, the actual being able to be agile in a business, then uh, it's not really existing. So in the portfolio level, there's the container for it, there could be a possibility to put it there, but the tools are lacking. Summary. So I would consider it as a smorgasbord for, for different patterns. 
safe is put together like uh, you have this pattern stolen from there and that's from Kanban and that's from Scrum and then you take this from this method and they kind of gather it all around and put it together and package it and add it a new bow tie around it and call it as a framework. And that's good as that it is. It's a buffet table of different practices and tried out things that could work. So use it just like that. Um, when you take parts of those safe, uh, I would recommend that using framing those as experiments, and experiments need to have the permission to fail. Otherwise, they are not experiments, making that very, very clear. They need to have the permission to fail. And then going on kind of deep and narrow, so one unit at a time, a couple of teams at a time, getting the feel of it. So it's the same that if on the yesterday's opening keynote was talking about agile pockets. You create that kind of influence there in the one pocket. You go deep and narrow and from there it starts to spread around in the organization. If those limited resources for the agile transformation are spent on the wide array, trying to change the organization with PowerPoint slides, it will not work. And let's go to the summary. So, my opinion, feed the challenge. Trojan horse for business agility? Nope. Trojan horse for agility, if you're lucky. Yeah, it could work. But with good people, everything works. But it gives the blueprint where we can uh, start to work and it gives the language of, of agility for the organization that doesn't really get it yet. Um, Framework that fits the multiple different contexts universally. So that blueprint could be installed like an operating system. Nope. Uh, extends the portfolio on business level and provides framework to work on lean and agile way over portfolio. Well, yeah-ish. Because it gives that kind of, uh, to the portfolio level, there's actually limiting the working process also on the portfolio level. We stop to have the million projects going on at the same time. So yes, it's kind of extending there. And we are limiting from the upstream of the work, the new projects that come in when we're going by the lean principles. But really to get it in the business agility, to being able to answer faster for the changing markets, well, that's not there, so you need different tools for that. But the container is there. Describes one blueprint how the project-driven product development organization can work in a more agile and lean ways. I'd say yes. So there it is a fit. It actually starts to remove those dependencies. It starts to bring in the focus. It starts to bring in the alignment of what we're really trying to build here. Moving away from fragmented million projects going on to an actually one single backlog, one single focus, focus on the execution and delivery. And step the direction of giving common vocabulary for the whole organization to discuss lean and agile ways of working when starting from zero. Actually, I could kind of strike through also the starting from zero because it gives the common language. It's just to be very sure that that language fits for your context as well. So if you're a non-software organization, probably it doesn't make sense to talk about user stories or uh, features or epics. Or if you, like, your work is maintaining and building uh, infrastructure services or, or this kind of, uh, kind of yeah, infrastructure for running servers and networks and all that, like at, one, at this one client, it doesn't make sense to talk about user stories. So it gives the language, but be aware that it's the correct language. And on that note, I will be ending my talk. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. I think we have plenty of time. Hello, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question will be for us. So you are saying that this framework shouldn't be applied for other different contexts other than software development. At the same time, uh, so during product increment planning, so we are involved with uh, cross-functional, cross-domains representatives. Mm -hmm. 
And so definitely during this event, so we may found different dependencies for legal, mm -hmm. for supports, for marketing activities. So how would you advise how we should manage all these dependencies and also deliver this on, on their side, on other sides and software development activities? Mm. Can you reframe the question a bit tighter? <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, during you know, planning activities, uh, when we are doing continuous product development flow, yeah. so we may found uh, lots of dependencies yeah. for other departments in organization, yeah. you know, for legal, for support, for marketing, and so on. Yeah. So in case uh, we are trying to achieve the, uh, f you know, the shortest time to market for some, uh, f yeah. for some increments, so definitely, we should be aligned with other yeah. organizations. Uh, I mean, yeah, functional organizations. Organization, yes. So and I how you would you advise to manage such dependencies? I would say the PR planning, so the programming planning, invol involving all the stakeholders there. So having that regular cadence, getting them in there. What I was saying about the software, uh, kind of be safe being software specific. I mean, it's for the kind of organizations that main goal is deliver software which also includes marketing and HR and all those different functions of the organization into that work. But the organization's goal is the software. Unlike, uh, let's say, a kind of non-profit that is trying to save the world, save the whales. That's not software and then talking yes. about user stories doesn't make sense. But you still might make sense to get people together on regular cadence and plan about how do we work together in the future. And we are planning all such kind of dependencies uh, with all the, you know, recommendations that safe uh, that safe is proposing. So we should we should manage all these dependencies also together with safe. So, so that means that I mean so, so we have to uh, involve for you know other departments. Yeah. And we should apply these practices not only for software development. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'd say that involve them, it doesn't mean that they have to kind of follow safe. Also, if you have the marketing involved in your program increment plannings, it doesn't mean that the marketing has to work on sprints. Right. Oh, ah, yeah, of yeah. course, sure. Yeah. So, involving them, it doesn't mean that the, they have to work on this specific way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Uh, could you go back to the slide, um, Lex, through adaptability? Yeah, so here you say that, um, well, you doubt that SAFE has instruments, uh, tools uh, in it to um, change itself, right? I'd say that um, it has those, it's just poorly utilized. So it's easy that it's kind of in the Trojan horse, you think about those. Uh, kind of all the agile things that are within it, but we lock the door. We don't really get the full potential out of them. So perhaps this should be more about how it's usually uh, well understood is with those things that we see safe as one size solution that we need to follow. We need to compliant with it. So people are not ready to challenge all those uh, assumptions in safe. So the the kind of way of systematically improving the process, uh, kind of challenging everything in the process, is not present. Yeah. Okay, so um, then I ask my question this way. Uh, if you take a look at the Scrum Guide, uh, there is this uh, statement in the end, a disclaimer, that if you don't follow any of the practices here, uh, then it's not Scrum. Uh, the same also if you open the Nexus Guide. Well, I'm not sure about less, but yeah. well, probably there is something like that. Uh, there too. So uh, this is kind of a common point for all the frameworks that we have today, all the popular frameworks. Uh, and uh, also uh, this kind of uh, touches the, uh, the other um, statement you had, uh, that uh, people are afraid to be not compliant with SAFE. Yeah. But uh, it looks to me like uh, it's the same thing even with uh, Scrum, that people are afraid to be not compliant with Scrum and also they're afraid to change it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, where is this line uh, where SAFE becomes dangerous and Scrum is not dangerous? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I would know when it kind of comes dangerous as Scrum comes dangerous. I think uh, it's... Just the, uh, all those mentions about uh, if you're not following these, you're not doing Scrum, or if you're not following these, you're not doing Nexus or Less or, or 
I don't remember if the safe has the same kind of thing, but I would think that they would draw the line somewhere in the uh, program increment plannings, probably. Uh, but I don't think that that's kind of dangerous. So I think those are only the methods and tools. Scrum is a tool, and we have to utilize for where it fits. If we are hammering the nail down, then the hammer is a good tool. But if we are trying to saw that uh, kind of plank of wood, then I wouldn't use the hammer. I would take the saw. And whether we want to call them or not something, then, well, be that. Okay. The organization. One, one more. Okay, good. But Obviously. very quick. Sorry, we are <laughs> okay. out of time already. Hello, Oli. Uh, thank you for interesting speech. Uh, can you share us some not successful of safe implementation in enterprise and why it not it was not successful? Uh, I think that one that I have it was was not successful, or they haven't admit the defeat yet is the force fitting. So they're trying to fit in the one single process. This is how the safe works, and now everyone needs to work on this way. And when it doesn't fit in their actual context, so then I think they are. They don't, might not realize that yet, but they're failing on that. Others, I'd say the jury is still out, but I think they will go in the good direction. But at least um, they haven't admitted def uh, defeat yet, but they're mm -hmm. going there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Oli. Probably shouldn't say that on video, yeah? <laughs> All right. But hey, thank you for uh, listening and... <laughs>